school 1200 baud packet is, is the focus here, but ways that we are using it in 2022. And I'll have a little demo of one setup that I have right here. And I'll kind of go through some of the other mix and match hardware and equipment software that you can use to set up your own station. My name is Mason Fewer, call sign KF7HVM, and we'll jump in. So, overview it's 2022. Why is packet radio still so complicated and finicky? And uh, guessing most people here have probably set up a station for doing packet or and pack it adjacent and if not you've definitely heard people complaining at the club and otherwise about how winlink sucks and it's hard to use and how ralph's beaconing aprs but nobody can hear him and it it's undeniably complicated and the main reasons are it's old tech it was developed uh in the 80s and most of the original equipment is still compatible with the systems that we use today. So what that means is you have less things that are automatic, you know, like in, in modern routing, you have UPnP for like automatic port forwarding and modern computer networks. Like you get a Wi-Fi router, you plug it in and it, it mostly sets itself up. Um, there's nothing turnkey like that here. Um, and that's kind of an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, the next reason is modularity. So because there's so many different kinds of equipment, different radios, different software, different modems, it is, there's no one guide that can tell you how to set it up. It's kind of up to each individual operator to understand the system, what they want to get from it, and what pieces of equipment they need to collect to put it together it's kind of what uh you know common in amateur radio but that is one of the reasons why it's so complicated it's very uh so there are some devices that do it all in one but there's also a lot of different layers where you can swap out components and that adds to the the complexity of interop and finally um amateur radio it's non-commercial so all of this equipment the software i mentioned is developed by hobbyists for hobbyists they they're not really getting paid for this it's not really money in 1200 baud packet radio over vhf you know, most entities that are doing rf data transfer are you know they're moved on from this kind of technology so as I go through these slides, uh, please feel free to stop me at any time and ask questions or make corrections or just throw in your two cents about your experience. Um, so feel free to do that. So what does a packet system consist of? I mentioned layers earlier and at the, the basic ground level, we have the radio. And the most important part of that uh, being probably the antenna. Uh, you know, if we're talking about packet, even more so than voice, um, the signals need to be clear and strong and well received. Um, if you have interference or intermod or you know just static, even you will fail to decode uh, a fair portion of packets. So it, mostly what I'm going to be talking about here is the, the 1200 baud setup that's been around forever, but um, there's also different encodings and that's where we get to the, the modem. So the, the modem component of the system is responsible for taking the actual bits from the computer or device or microprocessor and actually converting those into a radio signal and back again modem, uh, modulation, demodulation. So I mentioned the, the 1200 baud, I call it Bell 202, uh, audio frequency shift keying uh, for 1200 baud. Um, for 
9600 baud which you get on 70 centimeter and some parts of vhf um they use a totally different scheme it like randomizes the bits scrambles the bits and and encodes them significantly different um, and as you'll find as you look at different digital modes and systems very few of them are directly interoperable so that's what makes uh, the 1200 baud ubiquity of that kind of uh, encoding so interesting because uh, so many devices support it it's so widely deployed that there's you know a lot of a lot of interoperability um, in the past you'd see the modem implemented uh, on a hardware chip usually so this is like in the 80s the, the camtronics and the mfj had a few they pretty much just made a TNC around uh, a handful of modem chips. I think there's like two or three popular ones that, that were used. Um, and then they would couple that the modem chip that actually encodes the bits into audio signals with some kind of microprocessor that would do the application higher level stuff. Nowadays, I would say it's probably more common to have either the modem integrated into the radio itself and being exposed as like a, a KISS TNC, like a serial port that an application can directly connect to. Or you would have a soft modem, something like Direwolf, which is a program you run on your computer that exposes a serial port or interface that ends up using your sound card or an external sound card to actually uh, encode the signal. So it's more modular, but also requires a computer. However, for doing any kind of significant packet stuff, you probably already have a computer capable of running this kind of modulation scheme. So in that sense, you can get better results in software than you could in hardware. That's why those, those modems are becoming more popular. It's also cheaper, you, know, you can download software you can upgrade it, you can change it. With a, with a hardware chip, you're, you have less flexibility. So what are the bits? Um, that's where we get to the data layer of the packet system. And for almost all VHF amateur usage, you'll find AX25 packets. And I mean, what, what is a packet? It's, kind of just how the bits are organized such that you know disparate machines can decode them so you'll have a header that includes like the source call sign destination call sign the route any data payload and then a checksum which the receiving station can use to validate that it decoded the packet correctly so that's all AX25 is. It's encapsulating application specific data and different applications end up using it in different ways, which I'm going to get to in the subsequent slides. Um, there are two primary modes that we deal with in AX25 and traditional packet as uh, what well, is referred to as connected mode. So that's, that's what WinLink uses. And the idea behind connected mode is two stations are having a point-to-point -point conversation over an RF link. And each station keeps track of messages the other station has sent and acknowledged. And so this allows the two nodes to request uh, retransmissions if a particular packet was not decoded correctly, checksum didn't match, channel was noisy. You request a retransmission and the other station will send it. Um, receiving stations will also send an acknowledgement packet to the sender to allow to let them know basically like this packet was received uh, without issues. So go go ahead and send the next one. Is this, done you, auto, is this done automatically? Uh, yeah. So this 
kind of retransmission check some stuff happens at layer three that's what ax25 is all about and that's one of the modes that ax25 provides it's connected mode so as the user of the application you don't think about it as all at all and as the developer of an application like winlink you can assume it's being handled at a lower uh level so winlink developers you know they're not paying attention to like, oh, did I get this packet or not? No, that, that's abstracted away uh, from the application developer. And I, so I mentioned it's, it's point to point, but it's RF, so it's a shared channel. So you might have multiple users having their own point to point uh, conversations over the same channel. And in that case, if your station receives a packet that's not addressed to you, you just ignore it. And so it allows multiple senders and receivers to share the channel, but in connected mode, each node is only concerned with packets from one other source. So it's not really a one-to-many kind of setup. So that's, uh, that's in contrast to datagram mode of AX25, where you don't establish a connection, you don't acknowledge anything, you can't request a retransmission. Basically, you encode a piece of data and you send it out there. And unless the application implements some kind of acknowledgement, you have no way of knowing whether anybody received your packet at all. So it sounds like, uh, why would you want that? Like having the reliable transport is convenient, but in practice, it's, it's really chatty and wasteful having all those like acknowledgements and retransmissions going back and forth. It, uh, it ties up the channel and it, it limits the overall bandwidth available for the data that you want. We call that overhead. So onto the applications, uh, these are going to run on top of any packet system. So all the, all the lower levels are interchangeable. Um, but on top of that, we pretty much have two clear winners that are still using AX25 globally today active. And the first one is WinLink. And WinLink is global radio email that's their slogan that's what they call it and it runs over connected mode packet so there's two parts of winlink that you can think of and the first one is the service so the organization that runs winlink.org they also run servers around the world that handle email traffic and exchange email with internet mail servers. So without those servers provided by the people that, that run and manage WinLink, you wouldn't be able to send email outside of the WinLink network. And probably the whole, the whole system would be hamstrung. If they just decided to pull the plug on those servers, it would be very challenging to effectively use WinLink. Um, so it's, in that sense, it's very centralized. In the other sense, uh, it's decentralized because volunteers are the ones responsible for running RF gateways around the world. Uh, RF gateways can be on HF, VHF, UHF, um, different bands. They're all over the place and they're using different modes and encodings for actually uh, transmitting the packets. There's quite a lot of uh, VHF 1200 baud wind link gateways out there. Um, there's one in town, the N7 DEM-10 node, as well as one in Woodland, which is the W7 BO-10. So those are run by volunteers but they talk to servers that are ran and controlled by WinLink. And you can't just stand up your own gateway. 
in order to participate in the network, you need to sign up for a SysOp account. It needs to be approved. And you know, there's various criteria that you need to continue to meet in terms of overall uptime and settings uh, for your node to retain that account. So they, they control to that extent, you know, like who can run gateways. It's very centralized. That's the impression I want to get across here is like somebody's orchestrating this network. It's a brand. They're making sure that it, that it works well to the degree that it works well. <laughs> uh, on the software side, it's where things get a little bit different. Uh, so WinLink itself, they release two main packages, which are the WinLink Express client software. I'll be demoing that uh, a bit later. But that's what uh, you know. normal users are going to download and run to interact with the WinLink system. And then there's the, the WinLink RMS gateway. And that's what a sysop would run on a gateway node to translate between RF and the WinLink service. In addition to the products that WinLink.org makes and sells, um, there are also other implementations, commercial and open source that do exist. Um, there's also different software modems and stuff that's not AX25 that I'm not really going to get into here. But on the software side of WinLink is where things are, there's more choice, more open. Uh, you might find software to meet your needs. On the service side, you know, we, we get what we get. Um, and if WinLink wasn't there, I don't know what would be there. Uh, you, you know, we had packet radio in the past and some of those were connected like via BBSs and stuff. But for the most part, nobody does that anymore. Um, there's not really bespoke store and forward systems. Um, you don't really find like connected mode digipeters that would like route connected mode traffic across multiple hops. That stuff just kind of died out because it wasn't practical. And we have better, more reliable technology for doing that kind of stuff now. Uh, this is my last slide on WinLink. So if anybody has any questions on WinLink, now is the time. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so my main topic and the, the thing that I'm most happy to talk about and i think is most interesting really uh when it comes to packet is aprs the uh, automated position reporting system or packet reporting system and people acronymize it different ways um but it's really it's a network and it's a network for exchanging tactical information so what does that mean where where am I? What are my capabilities? What is my status? And, you know, if there are landmarks, objects, points of interest that I want to share with the local APRS community, I can represent those on the map. Because of the nature of APRS, it is a broadcast protocol. Um, so there's no establishing a connection. You send packets out there and everybody receives them likewise when other stations are sending packets uh, your station would receive them and in that way everybody in the local area kind of has the same picture of what stations and resources are available um, aprs I, I mentioned it's a network and I'm going to describe that in more detail later. But what makes it a network is independent operators setting up their own digipeters, which are basically a, an APRS station that will retransmit certain packets that it hears, and iGates, which are APRS stations that submit packets that it hears to the internet. Aside from the APRS IS, which are the servers that kind of handle the internet side of APRS traffic, it's a lot more laissez-faire than the WinLink side. So people can run their own implementations of these servers. You could run them in 
a mesh network. The code is open source. It's a lot more open and accessible and cooperative. And there's no, like, aside from the specification and the community, there's no one really like enforcing the rules of the network. There's no one telling you, yes, you can participate or not. Because that's the case, to operate on APRS, it's really important to be a knowledgeable operator, understand how the mode works, and choose settings that are appropriate for what your communication goals are. Um, because all of APRS operates on 144.39 megahertz in, the, in North America, it's a shared channel. So if you're submitting packets that have high numbers of, you know, DigiPeter hops, that's less bandwidth that's available for other stations, perhaps significantly far away from you. And I'll discuss that a bit later. Was this everything I wanted? Okay, so what kinds of traffic uh, do we deal with on APRS? Six main kinds that you're going to encounter, maybe maybe five. Um, so I'll, I'll mention these here and then uh, talk about some more of the network effects of it. So the most common type of packet that you'll see on APRS is a beacon. A beacon is a packet that contains position information and a comment. And there's lots of different ways to encode it. And it can include speed and heading and antenna information. And over the years, they've added more things uh, that can be represented in the spec. But for the most part, if you're going to be on, if your station is going to be on APRS, it should be sending a beacon packet at least once per half hour. That's how you announce your presence on the network to other nearby stations. And it's also important for working with like the, the APRS IS and message routing because DigiPeters will not send traffic to your station if they don't know where you are. So even if they can hear your packets, if you've never sent a beacon, they don't know where you are and a lot of times they won't send, uh, send messages to you. Uh, similar to the beacon is the status. It's just, it doesn't have position information. Um, usually this is thought of as like the purpose for the station, the mission. I usually put like the website in there and contact information for who's in control of the station. So if you look at, uh, some of the ones that I operate, you'll find like my email address in the status packet. And the other common type of packet is a message. So pretty much everything else that you can do that's cool in APRS, you're going to run on top of messages. So a message is a reliable one-to-one -one direct message or one-to-many bulletins, announcements, or group message. So when I say reliable, what I mean is even though APRS is not a connected mode application, it's a just shoot it out there, APRS messaging implements acknowledgement and retry at the application level. So uh, if you send a message over APRS and include an acknowledgement code at the end, that's indicating to the recipient that you expect an acknowledgement when they receive that message. And if you don't ever get the acknowledgement, most clients will retransmit the message on a decaying interval, like every two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, 16 minutes, uh, up to seven times or whatever is configured and then give up. So uh, reliable in quotes, but uh, it, it tends to work okay. Um, and several services on APRS have been built on top of messaging. So you might have seen like SMS GTE, which is a gateway for sending text messages uh, to cell phones and vice versa. There's other bots like, like the WX bot for weather. Um, you send it a message and it responds with a, with a weather forecast, that kind of thing. 
also built on messages, but part of the APR APRS spec is queries. So queries are special messages that are intended to be automatically handled by the receiving station. So I will do a demo of this definitely um, when we get to the end of the slides, because that's a really cool way to get information about who can hear who without necessarily like bothering anybody. <laughs> you just ask the station and it, it will respond. And then the last two, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on, uh, they're special types of beacon packets, I believe, that uh, handle common data formats for weather stations. And then the telemetry is a more general uh, way of specifying, I think, four analog values and eight digital values or something. So different stations use this for different purposes. Some will measure like battery voltage levels or yeah, any sensor that you have attached to the station could be reported uh, via a special telemetry message. All right. Um, were there any questions on on that, like the the types of packets or what what you might do with them? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm kind of new at this. In fact, I've been studying this on the extra uh, extra um, uh, level. They have the ARPS, but what is a packet? Can you kind of uh, tell me what exactly what a packet is? Yeah, so a, a packet is basically a small chunk of data. So this is a APRS packet sniffer that shows the raw packets that my temporary station is receiving here. So the packet uh, doesn't include the timestamp, the software adds that, but the packet includes the source, the destination, and the message body. So in this case, it's like a exclamation point, two, three, zero, zero, decimal, zero, zero, N. It's just raw bytes though. As far as the APRS protocol is, or as far as AX25 is concerned, the packet is just a chunk of data. It's a data payload. And aside from the source and destination fields, the format's not specified. So since APRS is an application that runs on top of AX25, it specifies the format for the, the message body. So when I say a packet, I'm basically talking about one line here, one transmission that has a source, a destination, a path, and some data. That would be a packet. So when I'm looking at these different types of packets, uh, like these ones with the uh, coordinates here, those are beacons. These ones without coordinates here are statuses. And, and like this one with the, the weird, like T hashtag and then a bunch of numbers, that's a telemetry packet. So the, in APRS, usually that first character indicates like the packet type. So you'll see like this is a, this is a status packet. It has a, uh, it starts with a little uh, greater than sign here. Mike, think of a packet as like a file that's being sent over the radio, and it includes just the data that he's showing you. Yeah, thanks. That is clarified that. One other little quick question. It might be dumb, but you said you have to have a beacon exactly uh, what kind of a beacon do you need? Do you have to put one on your backyard or can you use somebody else's beacon or what? Uh, so in this case, uh, the beacon refers to the type of packet. So most APRS software, when you set it up, there's a part of the settings where you enable the beacon and it lets you specify what you want the text to be, 
what you want the position to be or get it from GPS and various other parameters like how often to transmit it and what kind of path to use. I'm, I'm going to get to those in the next slide. Um, but let me see if I can just pull up those settings so that you get a better idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, are you able to see the settings window or do I need to add that to the share? No, I can see them. Okay, you can see the settings. Uh, over here it says like beacon, enable station beacon. Does that show up? I think I need to add it to the share. It's there. It? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so these this is how you would configure the beacon. And that, that's what I'm referring to. So it's not a hardware device. The, the hardware I talked about in the earlier slide, that's just going to be the radio, the modem, and the, the computer or, or microprocessor. And the beacon is, is a packet. It's not a physical thing. Hopefully that makes it a little more clear. Shane, where are you? <laughs> it does not look like anywhere near here. Yeah, I, uh, I've had my APRS on for only about a half hour and it's not showing anything on APRS.fi, but it shows something over in like Tokyo. What kind of radio do you have? uh any tone 578 mm, yeah if you if you haven't got it outside to get a good gps fix it might think you're still at the factory location well i've got the uh the gps in the window and it's showing coordinates on my radio is it showing 2300 sorry though <laughs> it might not be the right coordinates if it's showing 2300 and 113, that, that's not right. No, it's showing 46.139 and 122.912. Yeah, that, that sounds right. Yeah. Huh. But it's not showing know. up for some reason. Well, Jane, we'll if you want we'll to sit in your plug, I'll fix it for you. I can do it from here. Brilliant. All right, uh, I'm gonna get on to the next part of it. So I save some time for the demo and we can kind of go over more of this stuff uh, in the demo section. So uh, path considerations, what does that even mean? Uh, the path that you choose for a transmission is essentially telling the other stations and digipeters how many times you want your packet to be retransmitted and other directives about like, you know, if you don't want it to go to the internet, you can specify no gate in the path and then iGates won't upload it. The main paths that you should be concerned with uh, for modern APRS and it's one that, you know, needs to be said because maybe it doesn't get said enough, but a direct path is really still useful. Um, particularly if you have a fixed station with a good antenna, if you have reasonably good elevation, or if you have a lot of digipeters around you that you can hear well, you don't even really need hops to signify your presence in a local area. So most of the time when I'm running my station here in West Longview, I got a 5 8 wave mounted on my roof. I'm running direct. So maybe stations in Seattle or Portland aren't going to hear me, but that's fine because my traffic's not really intended for them. And if they were hearing me, that means, you know, if they don't care, I'm basically just causing interference down there in the Portland metro area to get my packet out there that people, you know, it's like, this is so far away. Like, what's the point? So depending on what your goals are, uh, consider a direct path for, for local stuff, uh, particularly like in an emergency or times when other communication modes are down. 
the channel bandwidth on 144.39 is going to be limited. So you don't necessarily want to bounce your packets out of your local area too far because then you're causing interference and limitations for others. So the other one uh, is kind of covered up by the video screens, but it's referred to as wide little n dash big n. And this is known as like the new style path specifier. And it just simplified the system versus what was there before. <laughs> and it allows Digipeter operators to better filter traffic and it allows users of the network to better express the intent of their information they're transmitting. So the little n, I gotta move these videos out of the way. So the little n refers to how prominent the Digipeter is. Pretty much the only ones that are, are used commonly would be uh, one or two. So if you have a wide one, that's typically considered a fill-in Digipeter. So low level, maybe mobile, maybe in your car, essentially not, not on a hilltop, um, mainly used to get you to a Digipeter that has more prominence. The other number two, if, if little n is two, so wide two, that means you want your packets to be repeated by mountaintop sites, high level, good antenna stations at a high level. Uh, but I mean, obviously every operator can choose their own settings for their Digipeter. And if I have a, you know, a little tiny one that doesn't have good coverage and I still use wide too, I mean, no one's going to stop me from that. It's just going to cause interference on the network. Not ready for that. <laughs> uh, so the big N that follows the hyphen here. So it's, it's a wide one or two, then a hyphen, and then some number for big N. And the big N is the number of hops. So if that's like one, then the first Digipeters that hear that packet will retransmit it and they'll decrement that number. So if it's two, the first Digipeters will hear it they'll retransmit it with a dash one. The next set of Digipeters will hear that and uh, they, they, they'll decrement it to zero, no hops left and the packet stops there. So there's combinations of these that you can provide in your uh, path specification. Like if you say wide one dash one comma wide two dash one, your first hop will be handled by a low-level Digipeter, and then it gets used up. And the second hop will only be handled by a high-level Digipeter. So why would you want to do this? I'll explain that on the next slide. Um, but I will also mention that there's some even newer style paths that refer to states or regions. So we have uh, Washington, little n dash big n and organ little n dash big n and these were brought in because the wide path you can think of like a circle expanding every hop on a wide path is going to go out equidistant in, in all directions but if i am operating here in washington and i want to direct traffic to portland or interoperate with a, a net down there in oregon Instead of using a wide hop, because I couldn't get there directly, I could use a uh, organ hop. And then if they're configured correctly, the Digipeters in Washington won't carry the traffic north. Only the Digipeters in Oregon will carry it south. So this was uh, introduced to kind of mitigate problems, uh, particularly on the, on the East Coast, where the states are a lot smaller. And you might want to get your packet into a particular region without hammering six state radius. So that, that's kind of the, the reason for that. So like with all things APRS, there's no one right, correct way to do it. 
it's all just situational and depends a lot on what you're trying to accomplish with your communication. But these are the general guidelines uh, that, that I would recommend. And I'll go through and explain them. So if you're on a fixed station, you should probably use a direct path. Or if you want to get out one extra level, like if, uh, you know, if there's a power outage and eye gates are not putting stuff on the internet, you might want an extra hop. Wide 2-1 is a good path for that because you're going to ignore any low-level digipeters, which if you're, you have a good antenna, those low-level digipeters will also retransmit your signal along with the high-level ones. Whoever hears it is going to retransmit it but the lower level digipeters might cause interference on your high level digipeters repeating it. So I don't know if that's too much of a tongue twister, but basically if you can get to a wide two high level digipeter on your own, you should do that to avoid activating lower level digipeters that might not have enough oomph to actually do anything productive and actually cause cause harm to your signal. Uh, and then for beacon frequency, I mean frequency, obviously you're going to be on one forty four thirty nine, but the period should be no more than one packet per ten minutes. Um, if you're not moving, there's no reason to clog up the channel with more frequent beacons than that. What I do with my station and what's recommended uh, by like the APRS main website, Bob Berninga, he recommends a proportional decay. And that basically means every time you transmit, you either double or triple the delay time between your next transmission. So if I start my station up, I'm gonna beacon once, then I'll beacon again in 10 minutes, again in 20 minutes, again in 30 minutes. And once I get to 30, I'll just stay at one packet for 30 minutes. And the reason for that is because this is a very bandwidth limited mode. Every packet that you're transmitting is a packet that you're not hearing. And so if the information that you're transmitting is duplicated, you haven't moved, nothing's changed. There's no reason to fill the channel with that traffic other than to make sure new stations who have shown up since your last transmission can know that you're there. For APRS, it's generally mentioned 15 minutes of monitoring should give you the full tactical situation. And I think it's kind of moving toward 30 minutes because uh, just with like APRS, IS, it's easier to kind of see that historical data. So in as a trade-off for not getting the full picture in 15 minutes, we get more bandwidth for diversity of stations, for weaker stations to get in, et cetera. Um, for a mobile station, uh, it should usually be like a vehicle, maybe a bicycle, maybe an airplane or something like, well, not an airplane. I'll get to that later. But a mobile station, it's something that's moving. Um, I recommend the path wide 1-1 and comma wide 2-1. So the reason for this is, you know, you're, you're moving, you might get behind a tree, you might get behind a hill. You, you're going to be changing your landscape more frequently. And so getting to a lower level digipeter might be more likely to get out. Um, also, the high level ones will respond to wide one. So you, uh, you also, you're not excluding any of the high level ones. You're just allowing a lower level digipeter to repeat your signal first, maybe. Um, and then wide 2-1. So that gives you two hops, low level and then high level. And around here, that's usually good enough to get to the internet. There are a couple of spots uh, between like Winlock and Centralia, Olympia area that 
aren't as good. Um, other spots in the woods where <laughs> you're just in a bad spot in the valley and nobody's going to hear you. So it's not perfect. Um, but two hops is usually good enough. And then for the beacon rate, I would say no more than once per three minutes, really, uh, unless you're going very fast or there's a particular reason why a resolution would be needed. Any more than once per three minutes is probably just spamming the channel and, and not helpful. The other thing to mention for mobile station uh, that I didn't put on the slide is the idea of smart beacon. So Smart Beacon is a heuristic, I'll say, that was initially introduced by Kenwood. And the idea is it adjusts the beacon rate based on your speed and heading and relative position. So if you haven't significantly moved from the last beacon, it'll just wait a little bit and, and try again later. Uh, it'll kind of back off. If you do move, uh, particularly if you turn corners or you know change heading significantly, that can override some of the rules. So it, it's essentially looking at your path and applying a little bit more reason about it so that you get points when your speed and direction change and you don't fill up the channel if you're just going straight or not going very far or not moving at all. Uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can control where this is going by whatever you're sitting at, like a computer or whatever. You, you, you can control where you uh, want this to go. Um, yeah. So these are going to be settings either on the computer software or in a radio that has APRS built in. The path is going to be one of the, the main settings that you can change. Uh, usually on like a radio, you'll be able to define a list of paths that you want to use and then switch between them really easily. So like on the, on the Yaesu FTM 400, it's got predefined paths. And once you go into the settings, you just change between them. You don't have to like type letters or anything like that. Um, as far as who receives it, you don't really have any control over that. Um, anybody within RF range that's able to decode the signal clear enough will decode it. And if the station that receives it is a digipeter, then it might retransmit it based on what path components are, are in the packet. The, I would say that the goal for most of this stuff is to get on APRS IS to, to make it to the internet is kind of the the goal for a lot of you know vehicle tracking balloon tracking that kind of stuff um, but it's not the only reason to use APRS and if the internet is down I still think that that APRS is a really useful mode uh, for just the local area written communications, position reports, status without having to, you know, call a net roll every few hours or so and see who's on the map. Uh, so the last one I'll talk about is the portable station. And I'll show some examples of this on the last slide, but basically think of like an HT with a crappy antenna and shoved in a backpack, like a water bottle holder or something. And it's like most of the time not being heard. Um, I mentioned on the second slide that like the antenna is probably the most important part in doing packet. And I, my experiments using HTs to test packet radio in in my office this one room two hts across the room from each other two hts across my house from each other not good enough to reliably decode packets again these are both fangs a lot of a lot of compromises a lot of issues but for portable stations you're you're limited and so that's why i think it's more okay to beacon frequently 
because most of those are probably not going to be heard, particularly if you're in remote locations. Obviously, you know, you adjust that if you're in an urban area and you have good coverage, you can beacon less frequently and use a, use a different path. But, you know, I'm thinking portable, you're like in the woods, you're, you're out there packing on a bike or hiking on a trail and you're trying to, to beacon out. That's what I would suggest. Wide one, one, wide two, one, or wide one, one, wide two, two, if you want that extra hop. Uh, sometimes in remote areas, that can be the difference between you getting to the internet or not. I know a lot of hams like to use APRS.fr, the internet service, or puts it on the map basically to let their family members and loved ones like follow them in, in remote areas or, or going uh, out of cell phone coverage, et cetera. Um, I think I got one more content. Yeah, yeah, okay. So one more content and then I'll talk about some radios then I'll show a quick demo and I'm gonna go over eight, but we'll probably finish at 8.15. Uh, so I've talked a lot about DigiPeters and iGates. Uh, any packet station capable of receive and transmit can act as a DigiPeter, but should it? So when people <laughs> first hear about APRS, uh, it's a pretty common project to try and make your own DigiPeter. A lot of people do it with like Raspberry Pis or, you know, just setting up your APRS client to be a Digi or an iGate. But I guess I'm here to say you shouldn't really do that. <laughs> a DigiPeter should be added, put in a specific place to fill a specific coverage gap. Shouldn't just put them everywhere because, uh, particularly not in low level areas that don't have good, like uh, unobstructed line of sight. And the reason why is because for a particular area, there, there's definitely there's an upper limit of DigiPeters that you can have there before they start to create a hindrance on the network. I kind of alluded to it earlier about why as a fixed station, you might not want to use wide one. But I mean, the same thing applies regardless of the path you're using. If you're in an area that has too many DigiPeters, the likelihood that the DigiPeters retransmit the packet at slightly offset times increases. And if you have multiple stations transmitting the same signal but offset, that's going to cause interference and it's going to reduce the likelihood that, that the packet's decoded. So you can get to a point where you have so many DigiPeters that they are interfering with each other and it actually reduces the overall bandwidth of the network overall usable bandwidth because so many of the packets it can't be decoded. Um, the other thing is location super important because a, a DigiPeter is not just about retransmitting, it's also about listening. And so if you have a low level DigiPeter somewhere downtown tall buildings or something, it's not gonna be able to hear as many packets as a station on a hilltop would. And so if your low level DigiPeter is not hearing stations uh, coming from across the hill or, or somewhere else, it could just transmit over the top of them. And then those higher level DigiPeters that, that would otherwise you know, retransmit that packet locally, they can't because the channel's busy or it causes interference. So these are these are the reasons why yeah there's a there's a sweet spot there's there's the right number of digis and there's the right configuration and it's also very hard to get there because there's not a lot of official coordination in the network. Uh, what else am I going to say? Oh yeah, so I gates um, that's a gateway between the radio, RF, and internet servers. It's two to two directions so i you know i send a message to a call sign 
and it goes to the W7DG station and to the internet and onto APRS IS, any other iGate that has heard the station that I addressed recently will subscribe to that traffic and pull down my message to them. And at that point, uh, it will retransmit it in the area where that station was heard. So it kind of uses the internet as a backbone to route traffic across a wide area. Um, I was gonna just mention that the, the worldwide traffic for APRSIS, so if you look at any point in time, the amount of APRS data from the whole world is about one to two megabytes per second. So you think about that, you know, it's 1200 baud is the, the line speed for, uh, for APRS. That is a lot of packets, but at the same time, it's not a lot of data by modern standards. So, you know, a Raspberry Pi can decode all of the APRS traffic for the entire world in real time, pretty much. That's, uh, it's not about bandwidth and size. It's really just about presence and latency and, and being on time. The last thing I'll mention here, um, this applies to any APRS station, but especially DigiPeters. If you're running RX only, that's kind of discouraged. Uh, yeah, you can send packets to the internet, but particularly if you're like the only RX, or if you're the only iGate in the area and you're RX only, that really hinders the network because people can't send messages through that iGate and get responses back. So the message might be delivered to a ham four states away without problem, but they can't acknowledge it because there's no way for that to get back to you. So running RX only is discouraged and running TX only is jamming. So if anybody wants to run, you know, like, oh, I'll just like strap this Bofang to this thing and have it send an APRS packet like every minute. If you're not receiving you're, you're jamming basically you're going to interfere with other transmissions comment yeah um shane and i have radios that that have been known to be called dumb aprs radios all they do is send and they don't receive anything what are your thoughts on those uh i don't know how it's actually implemented I imagine that they are checking for a clear channel before they send. And if that is not just built in, it's probably an option in the software, like how you have like the permit mode for channels. Like it won't let you key up if the channel's busy. I'm guessing there's a similar setting for APRS, but I, I'm not familiar with the configuration. I think you definitely want to do that. Uh, you know, any any transmitter, it, it shouldn't be keying up over other stations. That's like baseline for a cooperative network. Uh, if you're talking, Matt, you're on mute. I was saying that they don't have a, a two-way form of communication with APRS. They only send out information, but they don't transmit over the top of other stations. Yeah, so I, I think that's fine. That that would fall in the in the discouraged camp if it were a digipeter, but it's it's basically a tracker at that point. So as long as it's not you know causing interference, I wouldn't call it a jammer. Uh, what I think of is like the jamming thing is you get one of those like audio cables for your bow thing and you plug it into your smartphone and you turn the Vox on and you just let it send. You don't want to do right. that. <laughs> uh, there's also just like small devices. Like there's some Arduino devices where they just, they, they bit bang the APRS packet out like just with like pulse width modulation and then just send that to a radio and that's fine. It's cool, whatever, but like, don't do it on 144.39. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so putting the pieces together, how do we build this station? And we're already after eight o'clock, so let's get through it. Uh, you need a radio. So these are a couple different kinds of radios that I might recommend for packet use. Um, over on the left here, we've got uh, the TM281A. This is what we use up at the, the club. This is the W7DG APRS station, and we use it for Winlink. Uh, pretty solid, very affordable um, monoband, though. So you can only do VHF, uh, nothing 9600 baud. Not a lot of 9600 baud, but you, you can't can't really do it as well in there. Uh, for that, you need the TMV71A. Uh, this is a rig that I run at home, and on the B side I do APRS, and on the A side I do other monitoring, voice communications, rag chewing, what what have you. Um, I really like it for that because this radio has a six pin port on the back, which brings out the PTT audio out uh, for both 1200 and 9600 and audio in really easy to make connectors for it. Uh, I've had good luck with that over on the right side are some radios that have the modem and the client built in. So the, the TMD710GA, this is kind of Kenwood's flagship APRS mobile. It's got built-in GPS and a lot of settings for doing APRS. Kenwood's kind of an originator in the APRS world. A lot of their hardware supports it. And they other vendors have kind of based their implementation choices on what Kenwood has done. Uh, another one down here, the FTM400DR from Yesu also has APRS built in and you know, works, works pretty good for it. The, the downside for going with a, a built-in APRS, and that the, the upside is, is obvious, smaller package, it's all integrated, you don't have wires hanging around everywhere. Downside is you're going to be limited by the firmware of the radio, so you're not going to be able to do advanced features you're not really going to be able to easily change the software and these have limited capabilities you know like like you were mentioning with your eight eight seven eight or five seven eight like you, you can beacon the 710 will do messages 400 will do messages but like the station queries and more advanced functionality looking at the raw packets it's not as not as nice so if you're interested in aprs from like a protocol perspective and and using all the features and getting like a nice map view you, you're probably going to want to go with a computer or a laptop and one of the cheaper non-integrated radios so that you can bring your own sound card uh more radios so you <laughs> there's the 878 uh there's this one over here the pico aprs it's very small this is like a self-contained tracker device obviously you could put a better antenna on it and i would recommend that um the over on the left here so pico aprs has got it integrated everything integrated uh ft5 dr it's got integrated aprs uh d878 it, can send, I guess. Can't can't receive her message. The THD seventy four. This is Kenwood's extremely expensive, formerly flagship radio that they discontinued, and it can actually operate as a TNC for your computer. So you can plug it into your computer and then run the programs I'm about to show you, and it will do everything internally. So one one cable to the computer, and you got a, a TNC and a transmitter. Mason? Yeah. Um, with regards to like, like the 271 you had on the previous screen, would a Raspberry Pi suffice for that? 281. Would a Raspberry Pi suffice, suffice for that with its built-in audio, or would you have to add a better quality audio to the Raspberry Pi? I probably would lot. add a sound card to it. It, it doesn't need to be high quality, but as far as I know, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have in out. No, it doesn't. No, no. Um, so that's going to be think a USB cool. one would be adequate. Just a basic USB sound card for ten bucks. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, 
and I, okay. I'll get to that on the interface side. Oh, sorry. Of what I what I think about that. Um, so uh, just finish this one up. Yeah, if you want to run APRS in a Bofeng, you definitely mm -hmm. can do that. And in it fact, isn't. the KB7CZ15 station in Rainier runs on a Bofeng. Hey, Mason. <laughs> yeah. It's Ralph. Hey, uh, the, the latest version of that 878, the UV3 Plus, it sends yeah. and receives. I heard that, actually. Yeah. When we uh, were playing that's around, that's what I was using. Oh, you have the three? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out next time. You're going to be um, up there Friday? I will. I'll Go bring work it. on the weather station. I'll bring it. Cool. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, you know, a lot of this is software. So the hardware might support it, but the vendor manufacturer hasn't written software that can sufficiently take advantage of it yet. But software being software, you know, they, they could release a firmware update. They could make it better. Um, I think that's kind of what I've heard happened with the Anytone. They, they released a firmware update that added more advanced capabilities, fixed some APRS bugs. So it's always possible. And I guess what I was talking about before is if you go with an integrated TNC and modem, you can't change the software very easily. That it could be changed. The vendor could fix it. Um, but that's, you know, sometimes a stretch. All right. So the next piece you need, once you have the radio and the antenna is, uh, interface. So the interface kind of occurs, uh, there's different, different levels of complexity and different things that you might want to do here. So at the basic end over here on the left, we have things like the CM108. And I think this is what, what Shane was talking about. Like this, the cheapo sound card. This one here has been modified to be an all-star interface. So where they've added a transistor, some resistors. They took this far pin down here. This is a, a GPIO pin that's on this chip that is not exposed normally you pop the cover off and you can get a free gpio off of this pin and so they, they basically done a little soldering and and you can get these for five bucks six bucks they're very cheap and there's lots of guides online for how to do it so it's a good project if you want to get your hands dirty and make your own interface these, these are great this is actually what i run on my main home station if you don't want to get your hands dirty and you want a device that you can buy that is going to work and it's got a built-in Vox, you don't even have to configure weird serial port stuff to get your radio to transmit. I cannot recommend the signal link anymore. Um, I used to think they were expensive and stupid and like you could just, you could just hack it together yourself. And then I started using them uh, at the club and for Ed and over at the Rainier APRS station. Now I have one myself and they're just, they're brilliant. They're, they're so easy to use. You, you plug them together and for the most part, it, it just works. They sell pre-made cables for every radio. This isn't a sales pitch, but if you don't want to fight your gear, Signalink makes a very nice product and they're out of Grants Pass, Oregon. So it's fairly local. Um, now moving up in complexity as we go to the right here, uh, is the mobile link D I've used some of these in the past. What this device is, is a Bluetooth serial port that provides a radio interface. So that small black circle down there at the bottom is a TRRS plug. And so the company sells little adapters or the bear plug, you make your own adapter to go line in, line out, PTT. On the Bluetooth side, you connect it to your phone or your computer, and it shows up as a standard serial port. And you can select that serial port in any APRS application that you might have. So I've used these with APRS Droid. I've used these with Yak. And they've been pretty solid. 
Um, I wouldn't choose something like this for like a long-term installation because Bluetooth is finicky and the connection drops sometimes, especially if you're at a hilltop site where there's a lot of radios, you just, you wouldn't want to deal with all that RF uh, on a wireless link. But like in the vehicle, uh, I used to run one of these in my truck before I got the 400. Really nice, stays out of the way, and uh, you just connect it to your phone. And then all the way over here uh, on the far right, we have like a more integrated solution. So there's the, the venerable Camtronics KPC3, which anyone who did packet radio back in the 80s probably looks familiar to. Um, <laughs> This is an integrated TNC, so it's got software on it to run DigiPeter, software on it to run BBS. It's on the chip next to the modem. You can plug it into your computer over serial as well and use any application to feed it data. But it's different from the other devices and that it could stand alone. You, you could run it as a node without a PC specifically. And then down here on the bottom is kind of an interesting device I found last night. Uh, somebody took an Arduino, and this is what I was alluding to before. They, they basically made the, the PWM output AFSK at audio level, and they have some filtering to, to get rid of like the DC or something. And that's a full node right there on a custom PCB board using a $8 microcontroller. So... It's so a lot of ways to do it from the turnkey to the home brew. And I guess that's, uh, that's all I have on interfaces. Any questions on, on those? With the signal link, um, they're not bad priced. I just looked it up. Um, it looks like it'll work with just about any radio. Is that correct? Affirmative. I get yeah. the right right cable you got to get the right cable and you got to jumper it correctly but that you know that adds to the complexity but it also means that it's super flexible how hard is it with, with a signal link and and like a handheld radio to add weather station data to that or do you need a computer to accomplish that it's going to depend on the weather station but probably you'd need a computer uh, a Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi Zero would probably be sufficient. Um, something to, to translate that data into APRS format. Okay. That's hey, and also the, the signal link is not a TNC. So, you know, like some weather stations, you could connect a TNC over serial, like something like the KPC3 up here. Mm -hmm. And the weather station could talk KISS frames to the, the TNC, can't do that with a signal link. Signal link attaches via USB to a computer and it looks like a sound card. That's what I thought, okay. So then on the computer, you would run a sound card modem like Direwolf and that would do the, the data to audio encoding and vice versa. For the uh, weather station? Uh, no, no, just that would just take the AX25 packets and turn them into audio. Oh, okay. Doing yeah. the weather station, you need, you need, you need a separate receive. piece of software uh, that could, you know, translate the weather data into an APRS packet and send that over to Direwolf. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So if you're gonna do there something go. like like that, um, yeah, it, it might make sense to to. Well, it's going to depend on the weather station. <laughs> they are kind of yeah. finicky. That's down the road. I, I, I just was curious if, if, if there was a, a basic process that you followed to accomplish that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're going to want a Raspberry Pi in the picture somewhere. I've got those laying around, so. It doesn't have to be the latest model. You could get by with a two or a three. I've got both of those. But just something that can sit there and manage the, the output and the data and run somewhere. Yeah, otherwise, okay. you know, if you're dealing with microcontrollers or whatever the vendor firmware supplies, yeah, you're going to just have more problems, I think. I like software to find stuff for a while. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, question? Well, yeah, question, Mike. 
Okay. Uh, this uh, single link uh, USB, is that the only thing you'd actually really need to get all this stuff going? Or would you have, have to have one of those apple pies, cherry pies, or whatever they are, uh, to, uh, to do what you want to do? So if you have a computer or a laptop, all you would need is the signal link and the correct adapter cable for your radio. And then you could run the software on the, on the PC or Mac. Um, and it would use the signal link to, to basically bridge between the computer and the radio. Now you're talking, uh, you, uh, you're uh, talking UHF, uh, aren't you on the 144.39? Uh, so one thing that's nice about the signal link is it'll do all modes. Uh, so, you know, you can, you can run your radio on 70 centimeters or two meters. You could also hook it up to a, an HF rig. Um, you could also use it for SSTV or any of the other sound card modes that you might want to experiment with. Um, so it, it's a pretty universal interface. Um, the quality is high. The case is all metal, so it keeps the RF out. Um, that they're, they're well made. So I could hook this up to my Kenwood or my uh, Icon seventy one hundred and uh, do whatever I need to do. I would say yes, um, but particularly if you already have a seventy one hundred. You can just connect that to your computer directly and it exposes a sound card interface. 7100 is a really nice radio to, to use for data modes. What, what was the Kenwood you said you had? Uh, the um, 95 OS. 95 OS. I'm not, it's, not a, one, it's an older one. It's an older one, but it's really a good one. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, sure. it, it would be more appropriate interface. probably to use with the Kenwood, and then I would use the 7100 directly over USB. Hey, uh, I, I think Rick was trying to get in here, yeah. yeah. Hey, I was going to mention an interface. I don't know if you can see me. This is what Mike makes uh, NA7Q. It plugs into a Kenwood or whatever. This is a little Arduino with the Bluetooth in it. And you can use a cell phone apps like APRS, whatever, and get on the network. It's a small, cute package. That's it for me. Yeah, so it's a device seems pretty similar to the uh, the mobile link here. Um, I think that the difference being, I don't think the mobile link is a is an eight bit. Also, I can't really recommend the the mobile link too. Um, it doesn't have a great packet engine in it. The, the three I hear is better, but at the end of the day, if you're operating a fixed station, you want a, a solid APRS node, any of these kind of integrated packages are going to limit you. An integrated radio, it's going to limit you. Um, going with the CM108 or the signal link, plus a raspberry pi or like a like a windows surface tablet or laptop or something it's going to give you a lot of flexibility in what kind of operating you can do and it's going to allow you to hear and decode more traffic with these integrated devices you're, you're limited to the the firmware that comes on them and sometimes it's okay sometimes it's not great um whereas with the with the signal link or with the sound card you have software to decode the signal so it can get better it's usually free uh, i have nothing but good things to say about direwolf it's an amazing program that's what i was showing uh before we started here uh, this one yeah it's been sitting here decoding Basically, decoding packets during this entire presentation. <laughs> so, uh, are there any other questions on this before I just like jump into the demo and see if it works? 
Okay. So uh, I've kind of been flashing and teasing the software I have up here, but I wanted to start it at the beginning so it would have some time to hear stations over the course of the presentation. So this software here is called YAC, Y-A-A-C. It stands for yet another APRS client, but it's so much more than that. It's probably the most advanced APRS client that you can get. It's cross-platform, so it'll run exactly the same on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. It runs on Raspberry Pis. It, it runs everywhere, and it allows you to really dig into the different APRS features. And it's also actively developed. So you see here, this build was released 6 January 2022. Um, the guy's working on this all the time. So it's constantly getting better and bugs are being fixed. What can we do with it? Uh, so I leave this open a lot on my uh, main station. And I just like to see who's around me. Um, so you can see these are the stations I've heard. Like there's Matt, there's my home station, there's Earl's stations. We got Shane down here. Um, some of these you see are, are red. That means we haven't heard them in more than a half hour. Some are yellow. That means we haven't heard them in 15 minutes. And over to the side, you can rearrange these columns. I usually have the the comment over on the far end so I can see it better. Yeah, so you can see like what, what the last packet was, what the last comment was for these stations. It's a good way to see who's around you. Um, I also look through the, the raw packets just to see like what's, what's being sent most recently. And this provides a mechanism for easily messaging keyboard to keyboard. So like if I right click on my KF7HVM-1 station, I can say chat with station and just send a test message here. And when I send this, hopefully it works. Yeah, that window was not visible to us. Oh, okay. Let me let me make it visible. Ooh, a bunch of other stuff came up now. It's not what I wanted. <laughs> uh, all right, there was the chat window. I just sent a test message. And I didn't actually send it, I guess, because I have transmit disabled. So I'll enable transmit on this port and save that. Okay, I heard the click that time. And I can see that my message was sent out with wide 2-1. It was digipeded by KB7CZ15 and Rainier. And then my home station received the message and sent an acknowledgement on the same path. And then that was digipeded again by these stations. You see more repetition here. Um, this one got digipeded by Earl's station. So one of the hallmarks of APRS that you'll see a lot is repetition. And that's fine because it's a, it's a fire and forget protocol. There's no connected mode. There's no acknowledgements other than just acknowledging the message by sending a message. And so it's important to have this repetition to make sure that all participants in the network are able to see the same state. Um, so that's a message. I also mentioned that you can send queries. So a query is a type of message. And if I like right click on a station, like my home station here, I can ask it, who have you heard? So if I click station direct, it's gonna send a message. 
APRSD. And I just received a message from my home station that shows the most recent 12 stations or most recent, what is it, 14 stations that it heard. So this, you know, if you have a lot of stations around, you can use these kind of queries to get automated responses for, you know, who's out there, who's being heard, how often are they sending packets. Um, I can request, you know, if I ask like, hey, has this station heard W7SAK-8? And if I ask this question, it sends a message and I should get a response. It says, yeah, in the last 15 minutes, I heard him 36 times. And the 15 minutes before that, I heard him six times. I can do things like asking, what is the software version running over here? And it responds, this is a much older version. This is beta 165 on my home station versus 168 on this station. And what else was I going to show? I guess that's that's kind of kind of all I wanted to cover with that. Does anybody have any questions on on Yak? I will, but not tonight. I'm running out of steam in the head. Yeah, it's getting kind of late. I said I'd end at 8.15 and it's 8.29. So what I will do now is I'm going to switch my video over. I'm going to change this radio to the N7DM-10 note, and then we're going to try Winlink real quick. And then I'll wrap it up here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change the frequency to 144.920. Quick, somebody send me a Winlink message. <laughs> so I don't know how. So the, the APRS stack and the, and so sorry, APRS, Yak and Winlink both sit on top of the same packet interface. They both still use Direwolf TNC and I'm still gonna leave Yak open while I'm doing Winlink. So I have Winlink expressed down here and this particular station is configured to use the W7DG uh, club uh, address. So I'm going to select packet win link and click open session here. And the main parameter to enter is the recipient. So that's going to be N7DM. This is connected mode packet. So I'm first going to have to send a message that says, hey, N7DM-10, I want to make a connection with you. And if it's out there, it, it'll come back. Um, this right here, KISS over TCP host, basically just says it's gonna use this direwolf here because this is on port 8002. Hey, uh, Mason. Yeah. Uh, I just read on the latest firmware for the uh, Anytone 578 Pros, they allow transmit and receive and to send messages now. Oh, sick. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I just up upgraded mine to, to the 115 and it allows those features. So now we're going to have to learn more. <laughs> awesome. I'm reading that same thing in that email that you sent me. Good. I right. just have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> Mason, thanks for doing this tonight, by the way. I've I've enjoyed what you've shown and what you've covered because it cleared up a lot of gray area. Yeah, I'm, I'm there's still a lot. I was able to make less. it on short notice. <laughs> there's less. Huh, it didn't work. Well, here's the other thing about WinLink. If, if you take nothing else away from this session, the trick to WinLink is you exit it and you start it again. 
It's, it's how you win, Link. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that exit. over the years. You always got to restart it. And just restart it. That's win link for you. Okay, let me get these shared back again so you can see what's well, Mason, going on. Mason, I want to thank you for your presentation tonight, but I have to excuse myself. I have more All questions right. for you, but I will uh, get a hold of you later. Sounds good. Thanks for coming, Matt. Bye, Matt. Good night, everyone. Good night, buddy. Yeah, Matt, you have cleared the father a lot, a uh, lot with me. So, but I'm going to have to back out of here too. Uh, good, good presentation. I really enjoyed it. All right, well, I appreciate you coming here. You can see these messages flowing in, getting getting the win link test. And over here on the left, you can see the packets flying by. Over here on the right is the log. So it's going to receive an encoded message now. And there it is. It just popped into my inbox. One message received. And post an acknowledgement message. And then if I start a new session, it will send the acknowledgement to that station that uh, sent me the original message. It seems that APRS in an emergency, APRS would be for local, like amongst us, talking, whereas WinLink would be if we wanted to go out of county or uh, through the internet. Is, is that accurate that we should uh, maybe look at APRS to, for local operations and then leave uh, like the clubhouse, or you hire mucky nuts who understand it for Winlink. Is that an accurate uh, impression? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that makes sense. Um, I think of APRS, like it has the internet functionality, but it really is a local first kind of thing. Um, so for where are people at? what are they doing are they available do you have a vehicle that that kind of stuff perfect for aprs like put it in your status everybody can see it um winlink makes more sense if you have like net reports or you know longer kind of status reports things attachments to send um you know instructions operating procedures that, that, that sort of stuff makes sense through winlink whether or not that's going out of county or not uh doesn't really make a difference but like you're not going to send an attachment over aprs you're not going to send a message more than 62 characters over aprs reliably um so if you have anything more than 62 characters that you want to convey uh winlink's going to be the way to do it I get, to get to it now, and I, I probably will maybe next time. But uh, go ahead, Rick. I don't mention Winlink on HF really kicks because there's a couple stations around like uh, JJ's, so it'll be on 80 meters for so long. Then I'll go to 40, 20, 15, 10. It rotates. Hmm. So all else fails. If you're not hitting a win a one link here, you may be coming back to one in Kansas or somewhere and be able to send email back and forth. So that's the advantage of the one link. And I was gonna to mention to the APR is kind of fun. We got our friend, Mike, NA7Q. He likes to camp in remote woods area where there's no other communications and we can get messages back and forth to him on there too, which is nice with that. So, okay, I'll quiet up for a minute. That's all I had. Um, thanks for thanks for showing up. Thanks for your attention. Um, pr planning on editing the video down maybe a little bit, uploading it to YouTube. Um, I also have more content too. I need to be more realistic about how long I need to talk for. So um, thank you. Expect more to come. The car hey, presentation yeah. night, 2022. It was great. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. you. Did an excellent job. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my friend. Thanks, Mason. Cheers. Have a good night, everybody.